Testing, okay. Glad to see everyone traveled safely. Crazy rains out there. Torrential rains in some places. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that, you know. A little bit of rain won't keep you out of the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this evening, Lord, and we're grateful for this house, Lord. We're grateful that, um, God, we have a place to worship, Lord. Uh, we're grateful, Lord God, that we can come together in, in freedom, Lord God, in faith, Lord God, that we can uh, share openly what we believe in, Lord Jesus, and that we can study your word that we have, Lord. Father God, I pray, Lord, that as we read your word tonight, you continually help us understand your heart, Lord. Uh, Lord, you continually help us understand uh, the purpose for mankind, the role of the church, our identity in, in you, Lord. And Father God, I just pray that you'll bless every person here tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Praise God. Continuing our journey through the book of Ephesians, we're near the end. How long have we been in Ephesians? Since what? Since over a month. Since Galatians. Very good. Yes. Yes, yes. A couple months. It's been good though, right? What a journey. What a beautiful, illustrative journey. I really enjoyed the, uh, the, entire, the entire series and uh, let's just continue working our way through it. Um, where we are now, does anyone know what walk we're in now? The walk in harmony. Amen. The emphasis that Paul has been going through in chapters 4 through 6 is our walk. Our walk as the church, the role of the church, our walk as believers. Because he's dealing with the church and he's trying to help them understand, first of all, who we are in Christ, and second of all, who we are to the world. The role of the church, the purpose of the church, the behaviors of the church, and um, it's just beautiful, right? So we started uh, talking about our walk in unity and how unity is a role of the church and a united church is a better church. Uh, then he went on to talk about a walk in purity. And he was explaining to us the role of the church is, you know, we need to be pure. It's not just, hey, do whatever you want now that you're saved because who we are and what we do um, affects the world that sees the church and also just defines um, the love that we have for God. You know, if we love God, purity, our desire to be pure and pure from the sinful nature uh, comes out of a, our love for God. Amen. And now we're in a walk in harmony. And Paul started uh, using marriage as an example. Look at how a harmonious marriage looks. How great is that? How nice is it when, according to God's design, a husband fulfills his role in a marriage and a wife fulfills her role in a marriage? And he used that as an example to illustrate the, the relationship that the church has with Christ. But the key factor was the harmony. It was uh, a successful relationship, an effective relationship. And we can pull um, uh, biblical principles and values that affect our own marriages out of there but also help us understand the relationship the church has with Christ. Amen? And then last week we were talking about the harmonious relationship between children and parents because that's so harmonious, you know? Amen. And, <laughs> right, and my mother on cue walks in at this time yet again, just like last week. Yes, the harmonious relationship between children and their parents. Uh, and we find Paul explaining firstly to the children, children of the church, this is who you should be towards your parents, and this is why. Uh, and then we can see that if everyone takes their places in this harmonious relationship, it's just better. It's a better relational dynamic uh, for that type of relationship. And it also illustrates the relationship that we as children have with our Father God. Amen? And it helps us understand, you know, like 
the, the, the disposition we're supposed to have as children. But then he went on to talk to the fathers and the parents that said, now also, fathers, this is how you should be towards your children also. And now where we are in this walk in harmony, and remember what a walk is, it's every step we take on this journey of what we're learning about. We're new creations in Christ. We're believers. Our entire world has changed. Our worldview, our understanding, everything has just been turned upside down because the Spirit of God came into our lives and showed us the light. This is really what I created mankind to be like. And now we're on this journey and this walk learning about what that means. And we're learning about relationships. We're learning all these things that we're learning in these Bible studies. And we're like, wow, I have such a greater appreciation for the way God designed man. And all I want to do is, is, is find my place in God's kingdom, in who I'm supposed to be. And we have the Holy Spirit that helps us, change us literally from the inside out. So now we're going to continue and we're going to talk about the harmonious relationship between slaves and their masters, okay? Um, harmony doesn't mean legalistically. It means fellowship and cooperation. Harmony isn't when you're living by the letter of the law to do something the right way. It, it, that's not harmony. Harmony is fellowship and cooperation, it's when you're working together and, and the relationships and the system is just working perfectly, harmoniously together because everyone has become exactly who they're supposed to be. And we just fit like better cogs, you know, in, 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 in the system. Do you understand? Um, I've used this example before that when I think about God's creation and the entire universe, I see everything working harmoniously together to sustain existence. It's, it's as if God, which he did, he said, this is how it should be. This is how everything should exist. And he spoke everything into existence. And every molecule and ad uh, atom takes its place in the universe and works perfectly to create what we have. And if we had this willful, if everything was just willful like human beings, the place would probably fall apart we find that human beings are not so harmonious when it comes to this is who we're supposed to be. Our will puts us in a place where we can choose to fall out of harmony with God's ways. And that's what sinful nature is. Amen? It's a good way to see things, right? Okay. So let's... Let's... Mm. I didn't sync the computer. Can, oh, thank you, Alan. Let's begin reading Ephesians um, chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 5. And again, we're addressing uh, how slaves treat their masters. Just give me one second. Give Alan one second. There we go. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one, of, each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So again, we're going down this walk in harmony, and we see that Paul now, he addresses marriages, because he's helping marriages understand, like, hey, guys, you could just have a marriage and because of what the culture is of that day, you may not find yourself having the best effective relationship as far as God's design is concerned. So, so this is a biblical principle. Same thing with the relationship with parents and children. And now he finds himself talking to slaves and their masters. The Old Testament and the New Testament included regulations for slavery. Okay? Um, there's actually many regulations in the Old Testament, right? Uh, many, many things that the Old Testament addresses because of us as human beings, because of uh, who we are susceptible to being. So you see all these kind of regulations. And another regulation that you find in the, in the Old Testament is about divorce. These regulations did not encourage or condone such situations, but were given divinely 
They were practical ways of dealing with the realities of the day. Look what Jesus said. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. So you look in the Old Testament and you see a regulation there and all of a sudden you're like, oh, so it's okay. And matter of factly, he says, look, the Old Testament defines this because it was a reality of the day. So there had to be some kind of explanation of how you deal with this. But God's design says it was never supposed to be this way, but there are regulations there. You look at a situation such as slavery. What goes to your mind when you think about slavery? It's horrible. It's, 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 it's full of prejudices. It's full of mistreatment of fellow human beings. But then you find in the laws of Israel, you find a regulation concerning slavery that has masters treating their slaves better than any other nation. They weren't allowed to treat their slaves badly. Amen? Paul needed to address many common relationships, occupations, and situations on regards to this new life that was just only starting to be understood. Everyone is now becoming Christian, and the mysteries are being revealed. These are the first people that are experiencing the dwelling presence of God, the very heart and mind of God coming inside people's lives and speaking to them and saying and convicting people and helping them understand, you're a human being with sinful nature, and now my Holy Spirit is confronting that sinful nature and challenging you. And people are getting affected. This is what we experience now. But just imagine you go back to here, the, 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 the early church, and these are the beginning people that are starting to experience this. Not only are they experiencing it, but the world is seeing them at the same time. Amen? Before this, the spirit-filled uh, life of believers was a mystery. No one was experiencing the dwelling presence of God in their lives. Christianity formed a new order in society of new creations. It is new at this time. All of a sudden, there's this new system filled with not biblical principles only, but God's original design affecting the hearts of men. What do we talk about when we're talking about marriage? What was culture like? What was the culture for a husband? How did a husband treat their wives in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus, back in those days? It was a very different system. And what did Paul say? Husbands, you need to love your wives. And it was challenging because here he's, he's establishing biblical principles of not establishing, just putting back on the hearts of man God's original design. A husband's supposed to love his wife, and culture has husbands just demanding respect. And, and assuming that, that wives are supposed to do this and husbands are supposed to do this. Same thing with the children. It was a matter of fact. Children were supposed to respect their parents. It was actual law. And we find that Paul finds himself saying to the fathers, don't exasperate your children. Talk to them. Have a relationship with them. And what is he doing? He's establishing to this, this, the, the new creations in Christ Jesus and he's helping them understand, hey, you know what it means to be a new creation in Christ? Your entire world is changing around you. People don't understand it. We're countercultural. We're kingdom-minded. Amen? What happens when your world changes? When everything you knew and learned about life is now confronted by the truth of your existence and purpose. That's what happens in a believer's life. Isn't that what happened in yours? Happened in mine when I became a believer? All of a sudden, no one around me understood what's happening. But in my own heart, I was being confronted by a whole new world, by the kingdom of God. And I was being challenged in a way that only I understood. And I was being challenged with kingdom principles. Amen? Paul found himself being divinely inspired to address many of life's circumstances and was used by God to divine biblical boundaries. In this whole new world of Christianity and Christians who are still dealing with their current cultural situation, we're still affected by our surroundings. We're still psychologically affected by our surroundings. We're still, you know, th that's just a part of life. And here we find Paul at the, this very time getting divine inspiration to address these, what's the point of talking about marriage and, and, and parents?
parenting and slaves and how they treat their masters because behind the scenes of everything, we see God's heart in relationships, in the way that we treat other people, in the way that we take a submissive place in our relationships, all because of the love of God. Amen? These boundaries reveal the heart of God. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. Right? And that's what we're challenged by. And that's why you find Paul in Ephesians, when he's talking about the role of the church and the walk Christians are supposed to have, you find himself talking about the stuff that when we look at it, we're like, yeah, that's pretty much common sense. But again, when you go back hundreds of years into Ephesians, into Ephesus, and you remember what their culture was like, you realize, like, wow, this is very countercultural, actually. And, and, and what we're about to talk about, you're going to see how countercultural it is. Old Testament Jewish slavery and New Testament Roman slavery were very different from each other. Because here you have me saying that, hey, you know, if you go back to um, Ephesians chapter 3, if you guys were here for Ephesians chapter 3, and you remember when I was talking about how Paul said Christians are slaves for Christ and how the whole beautiful view of being slaves in Christ is when you look at the Jewish rules for slavery and you remember that, hey, being a slave in Israel is not so bad. It's not so bad as being a slave in the other nations because all nations had slaves at that time. But then you find yourself, if you're a Jewish slave and you have your master who is obeying the laws of Israel, laws inspired by God, who are telling the masters, you need to treat your slaves this way. The law was clear that foreign slaves could not be mistreated or seen as inferior. They were to be loved as fellow Israelites. Law gave slaves a day off every six days. All slaves were to be freed after six years. Freed slaves were to be liberally provided with grain and livestock. The Jubilee, all slaves were freed even if owned by a foreigner. A slave could choose to remain a slave. Those are good rules to live by if you're a slave, right? I get my grain and my livestock liberally provided. I can choose to leave after six years. I have to be treated as a fellow Israelite, even if I'm a Gentile. I have to be treated equally. I have to be treated good. That's a good situation. So when you look in the, in the laws of Israel, you're like, man, slavery in Israel was very different than slavery in the rest of the world. The difference is Paul is addressing Roman slavery because some of these Christians that he's talking to are Roman slaves. So we did have this idea of Israel slavery, and it's a, it's, it was okay. It wasn't so bad. As long as uh, your masters were, were you know, submitting to the laws of Israel, they're treating their slaves very good. It had to come from the heart. They had to treat them like family in, in, in many cases. They were good. Roman slavery and, and slavery in itself for the rest of the world was very different. Amen? When Paul wrote this letter, there were over 6 million slaves in the Roman Empire, so it was probable that some of the Christians were Roman slaves. Roman slaves are viewed as less than human and were treated brutally in most cases. That sounds more like the slavery we understand. Absolutely this kind of slavery existed back then. It was brutal. Roman slaves are viewed as less than human and were treated brutally in most cases. Can anyone relate to these conditions? Maybe not as severely as slaves, right? But... Uh, think about, think, put yourself, how can we apply this to ourselves for today? Go on. Thank you. 
Ideal, ideal example right here. So let me ask this question. If you were not a believer, you did not have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, confronting you, speaking to you, helping you get through your day, reminding you who those people are, reminding you about these principles that you learned through your reading your Bible and understanding ways that actually helped you cope with the situation, what would that, that be like? Can you imagine what these servants are going through here that Paul's talking to? Amen. Yes. You put yourself in this situation here with these slaves, and, and, and first of all, imagine that you were, first of all, they didn't have human resources, right? Uh, you know, stuff like that that we have today. They didn't have Eddie over there to protect them, you know. Um, you know. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of, of the, the slaves of this day. What exactly is Paul saying, and how shocking is what he's saying? This is what he's saying. Servants or slaves, you are not to rebel against your masters, run away from your masters, or be angry with your masters. You're to obey your masters. First of all, can you imagine how these slaves feel? They're like, you realize how we get treated, right? You realize that these Roman slave masters that own us, they mistreat us all the time. They abuse of us. And you're telling us, because my human nature's response to the way they treat me is I, I hate my life, I hate my job, I hate my situation, I hate my slave masters, I want to run away from them if I could, I wish my life circumstances would be completely different, and I'm miserable because of my current circumstances. I wish I had it differently in life. And Paul is saying, enthusiastically obey them. Enjoy your life as slaves. Just, just, just follow them. Just obey them. Submit to them. Can you imagine what it's like for these slaves? And again, we find Paul following the theme of everything he's talking about right now, harmony, a walk in harmony. 
the role of the church. How is a Christian slave supposed to act? And we hear what Paul is saying, and it's just like, all right, you don't understand my circumstances. But we see a biblical principle emerge that affects us in so many ways. We're not under those same conditions, but you hear Dawn's experience, and all of us can relate to it. We put ourselves in the same shoes. We see how she handled it. She already understands the biblical principles behind it. She, 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 uh, she, uh, she lent, lean, leaned on the Lord for help in these times. And what was the result of it? She helped get through the situation. It was hard, but it gave her peace. It gave her joy based on her current circumstances. Did the other people in the office walk around miserable? Did they get mistreated also? Did they not have the same means to deal with the situation? That's what we heard, right? We hear a Christian's experience and says, you know what? I didn't like my circumstances. I didn't like the way my bosses treated me. But the way I looked at them changed my heart. And the reason why I looked at them this way was because of the love that I have for God, firstly. And because of my love for God, I was able to look at them with some level of love also and realize that they're also God's creation. Isn't that exactly what we're seeing here? Obey them, not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, because that's what Christians do. Doing the will of God from your heart. That's the will of God. And you find the life of a new creation, a spirit-filled believer, gives you a whole different perspective of life if you're living by biblical principle. Because we can be Christians and we could ignore stuff like this and we can hold to our own feelings. And then you will be miserable. You will hate your circumstances. So why is it so important that we find Paul addressing slaves and their masters in order to live a harmonious life and telling them shocking, controversial um, 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 explanations? Amen? How is a Christian who is a slave under these conditions supposed to act? By nature, anyone would react to these conditions with normal human nature. Anger, malintent, bad will, amen, bad attitudes. Christianity leads to a change of nature, a, a literal change. What's the word here? Where is it? Sincerity. It's not forced. It's not fake. Something happens. Real change. Literal change is taking place in your life. The changes of a new creation, they're coming from a divine God who's taken his place in your life. You're not just a Christian who's like, well, the Bible says this, so I'm forcing myself to do this. You're a Christian who's like, has a relationship with God whose nature is now in your life and your nature is being changed and you're a new creation in Christ. And you find yourself on this walk and you're what? You're being changed. You're becoming more and more of a new creation. Amen? Christianity leads to a change of nature, but why? Is it just because God wants us to be passive doormats? No. No. Why are we given biblical instruction on how to deal with these conditions? Because we glorify God when we do. We live better lives. We have better experiences based on our regular life circumstances. Remember what I was talking about? What was the purpose of regulations? Did it condone such realities? No. It didn't condone it, but it dealt with reality. These are situations that we deal with. So why are there these biblical principles that we get to live by? Because we're condoning these things and saying, well, this is just the way it is, so be passive, let people walk all over you. No. It's because they're realities. Eddie. Amen. Amen. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one, uh, each one for whatever good they do. Trust me. I see what's happening right now. 
you glorify me. Don't worry. I'm seeing everything that's going on in your life right now. You're not alone. Have faith and trust me. Do the right thing. But God, it's so difficult. You don't understand how upset I am, how angry I am, how I get treated. You don't understand. No one understands what it's like to be me. So I deserve a little bit of leeway in this kind of area because it's a little extreme for the, for the normal person. People really don't understand what I'm going through, God. So give me that. Allow me to be as upset as I am. And God's standards are, I do understand that. But I'm trying to show you if you have a whole different outlook on life, if you allow my peace, if you do these things because you love me, everything's going to change around you. You're going to feel better about your circumstances. Amen? Why? This is why. Because when you do these things, when you find yourself slaves, don't run from your masters. Don't act badly towards them. Just obey them. If they say something, do it. Why? Obey them because you will win favor when their eye is on you. It's automatic. You're doing the right thing. First of all, that's not how a slave responds. A slave is mistreated, brutally forced and coerced to do whatever the slave master says. So how would it look when you, a Christian slave goes to work and he's like, Master, before you even need to beat me, I'm ready to do whatever you want. And even if you beat me, that's okay. I'm still going to do whatever you want because I want to serve you the right way. What? What? How countercultural is that? Wouldn't the slave master be like, why is this slave different from any other slave? And doesn't that give the slave the opportunity to show the glory of God? Because I'm a believer. Because I'm a new creation in Christ. Because the God that wants to come into everybody's life came into my life and I'm literally changed. I'll be a different person and I'll show the world I'm a different person. And I respond very differently in most situations. My marriage is different. My parenting is different. My servanthood is different because the presence of God is in my life and I'm not being forced to try to be someone else. I'm literally a different person in all of these areas because I have the presence of God in my life. That is why, world. That is why you see me as different. That's why you see me serving. That's why you see me loving. That's why you see me responding differently because I love God and it's sincere. My efforts are actually sincere. You know, there's um, a book that Crystal and I just went through called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a book that's in Pasadena's library, but I wanted to read it because I read an article written by this um, uh, another executive pastor about being an executive pastor, and he said a must-read is this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, life-changing book, and there's the section of the book that talks about uh, being sincere. Don't flatter people because flattery can be smelt a mile away. Be sincere. Find actual things to like about someone you don't like because it'll change everything. And again, this isn't like a biblical principle. This is just like, you know, good motivational, help you with people relations. It is just a people relation book, and it helps you with people relations. But the book opens by saying this. People relations is like magic. When you find yourself having effective people relations, everything changes around you. Relationships change. People treat you differently, and it feels like it's magic the way things just happen. And it's true. You apply some of these people relationships in your regular um, relationships, and things just automatically start to be different. And it's the same in this kind of situation. Paul is establishing a biblical principle that comes from the heart of God. He's saying, Slaves, I know what your present circumstances are. Don't worry. Your reward's in heaven. But I'm telling you, from the heart of God, if you find yourself being submissive to your slaves, serving them with the heart of God, what does Scripture say? Do everything you do unto man unto God. And that helped me a lot in Teen Challenge myself. But what happens as a result? Why is the heart of God telling you to do this? Because God wants you to be a passive doormat? Matt? No. Because he wants you to have an abundant life regardless of your life circumstances. What if your circumstances are as a slave? 
how am I supposed to have abundant life? What if I'm mistreated everywhere I go? What if it's, it's different for, 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 for me, God? Other Christians don't have it like me. How am I supposed to have an abundant life? And he says, you can have an abundant life in the midst of your circumstances of life. Even if you're a slave, a Roman slave who's brutally mistreated by a Roman slave master, I'm telling you, if you do these things, things will change a little bit for you. And not only that, you'll just glorify me at the end of the day. And even if that person doesn't change and doesn't see it, I do. And I'm satisfied. And your rewards are in heaven. Because you, out of love for me, are trying to live the Christian life. Amen? Good stuff, right? This type of reaction is the manifested evidence of the change of nature. It's real. It's a manifested evidence that something is different about you. It displays the reality of a new creation. It's not fake. It's real because it's rooted from love. And that is the key here. If it's fake, if you're trying to live biblical principles because you're forcing yourself to be a Christian and you're not getting it, something's just not going to fit there. It's not going to work. But when you're living out biblical principles because you have a relationship with God, it's simple. It's not complicated. It's simple. It's going to be real. Your love for God is going to be real. Your reactions and your responses to life circumstances as a Christian are going to be real. You're not going to find yourself being like, well, I'm doing this because I have to because I'm a Christian and the Bible says so. You're going to find yourself, and we see this theme comp repeated in Ephesians. You find yourself doing these things simply because you love God and his joy and his happiness and you're released from the situation. Amen? We are to do what is asked of us enthusiastically. Remember what we read last week? Children, obey your parents enthusiastically, right? Enthusiastically comes from the Greek phrase en theos or full of God. So enthusiastically means do something full of God. You find Paul telling your, the slaves, obey your slave masters enthusiastically, or in their language, be full of God, full of godliness, the life of a godly person. Respond that way in your life circumstances. Amen? The enthusiastic work you do for your master is not primarily for him. It's for the Lord. Paul's saying do this. It's going to affect the way that your slave master sees you and treats you. But do this. Why? Who is it for? It's for God. It's mainly for God. What will be your reward? First of all, your reward will be in heaven. Amen? You may not get noticed by people, but God notices everything. He sees everything that's taking place. He sees what's happening. And he loves you. And you have favor with him. And he has compassion for you. And every time he sees you in a life circumstance that isn't fair, and he sees you finding it in your heart and your love for God to just be a man or woman of God in that situation, what do you think God does? you think he stands and be like, good, that's what I expect of you? Or do you think he's like, man, I'm so proud of you right now. I have, I'm just adding up the rewards to you. I love you so much, and I'm so happy that despite your circumstances in the sinful world that you live in, I'm going to pour out my rewards on you when you get to heaven because you love me so much that despite of your circumstances that you're going through, you are, you are glorifying me. Don't you think God, who's a loving God, who sees all things and is compassionate to his children, who gives good gifts, don't you think he sees it that way? Diane. Amen. Amen. He couldn't wait till he could do that with him again. He couldn't wait. He's like, man, I want to have a feast with you. 
Amen? If you haven't, and these are using words from the Bible, despise the days of small things. If you haven't despised the days of small things, but have been faithful in your present situation, you will be given responsibility, blessings, and reward eternally. I believe that. You hear Pastor Dan talk about that, that everything we do on earth here is a resume for the future. If you're trusted with the small things, you can be trusted with the greater things. We see that in the parable. If in the small situations in life, like what? Like going to work for a boss where the rest of your church doesn't see you. They, they're not seeing how you react. You're surrounded by people that are reacting with human nature. You have the opportunity to do the same thing. And it's challenging. And I'm sure there are times that that came out. But at the same time, you also find yourself being faithful in the small things. And when you're faithful in the small things, God can trust you with greater things. So it is very important. Why does Paul address these issues? Because it doesn't matter the small thing or the big thing. It's a matter of the heart. When you respond to the small things the right way with godliness, it's not because, okay, it's easy for small things. No, it's because of the root of it is your heart. Your heart is, I just want to be godly with whatever circumstance I'm given. If it's a small one, I still want to be godly. And because of that heart of it, God says, okay, then I can give you greater things too because your heart is in the right place. You will serve me faithfully. Amen. There are many small things in my Christian walk that they're, in in my mind or in many people's minds, irrelevant when it comes to being a Christian. They're really not things that you have to work on. But when I became a Christian, um, helped by the extreme rules and regulations of Teen Challenge, the things that you're not allowed to do, you know, I wasn't just left to my own justifications of, you know, this is okay. I was put in the circumstances of, no, as long as you're part of this program, you cannot do this. You cannot speak that way. You cannot do these certain things. And it's like, okay. So I find myself getting challenged by these things that my human nature still likes to do. And the conviction was there. And I have an opportunity in my walk. I have an opportunity to justify small things and say, those aren't the things that I'm trying to work on right now. I want to work on the big things. The small things aren't important. God doesn't mind the small things. See, the problem is the heart of it. When your heart is, God, I don't know, I don't, I don't even want to be tempted to justify who I am or the things I do. I just want you to help me be whatever you want me to be. If you want me to stop doing this, I struggle with that. But it's the small things. Help me. Help me stop doing that then. That was my experience. Is, is that kind of what you're saying, Eddie? See, when the heart changes, it's the root of it all. Everything just everything is affected. The small things that you justify, the big things that may be easier things to change, and the visible Christian manifestations that people see, the behind the doors ones are the like, you know, the small things that, you know, kind of ignore. But when the heart of it is just like, God, just, I want to glorify you in front of people and behind the scenes. Yes? Yeah. You find yourself like that, Mom? Oh, oh no. (laughs) Go ahead.
Amen. Thank you. Thank you that one of my parents loved me. <laughs> Second, if you work enthusiastically, full of God, wholeheartedly, even in circumstances like them, under Roman slave masters, and you work enthusiastically and wholeheartedly, you will receive benefits presently. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but to help to, for God. But what happens? Obey them because you will win favor with them when their eye is on you. They will see it. Amen. In Scripture, we see people who are already hard at work who were called to serve God. Moses was shepherding his father-in-law's sheep when God called him. He was a diligent worker. David was a shepherd. He had the heart of it. He was called to it. Elisha was plowing the fields when Elijah handed his mantle to him. And we see that. You know, you're just a diligent, hardworking, out of your love for God, submission, obedience, enthusiasm. Why? Because you have to because you're a Christian? No, God's letting us in on something so much greater. He's like, because when you do this, I, I just want you to have an abundant life despite your life circumstances. You'll get favor with people around you. Your rewards are in heaven with me. But I'm telling you, it's just a way of life. You'll get favor with the people who see you also. It'll be very different for you. may not be the best. May not, people, people may not change entirely around you, but you're going to have a different experience. Wow. What an opportunity you had. Change, change things. What an opportunity. You exhibit your godliness because you love God, but as a result, God blesses you. Glorify God in the small things. Amen? People may wonder why you're so enthusiastic about, about what you do regardless of circumstances. Not only will you enjoy the things that may make you miserable, it helps you get through your day, right? People will come to know that you do what you do because you're a godly person. Why is it different? Where are we in Ephesians? The role of the church. Paul's not just like, hey, church, let's talk about some minor details that you should do. These are the new rules and regulations for your new life. That's not what he's talking about. The whole theme of where we are is what? The role of the church. A walk in harmony is where we are right now. Basic principles to being a Christian. The normal Christian life. This is what it means. This is what you do. This is why you do it. And this is the beautiful result of doing it. Amen? And then, just like everything that we see, okay? Go back to marriage. What does he start with saying? Wives. This is what you need to do. And the way culture looked was like, yes, we agree with that. That's how wives are supposed to be, submit to your husbands. But then how did he end that? He said, now husbands. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Our culture doesn't say anything about us. We don't have to do anything. I don't see that in the Greco-Roman laws, what husband, husbands are supposed to love their wives. The law does say, wives, submit to your husband. So what does he do? He says, wives, this is what you're supposed to do. But then he says, also husbands, this is what you need to do. Likewise, when it came down to the parenting, children, this is what you're supposed to do. Yes, we all agree with that. And he's like, but also parents, this is what you need to do also. And we find that same um, system here when he says slaves, this is how you're supposed to act. And it's like, yes, that is how you're supposed to act as slaves. But then he says, and masters, because surely there are some slave masters too who are influenced by their culture, influenced by their fellow bigwigs. Amen? 
Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them. Wait a minute. That's how you do this kind of job. Since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, you're putting me at equality with my slaves, and there is no favoritism with them in the eyes of God. He just levels a playing field for everyone. Husbands, wives, children, parents, slaves, masters. Let's level this playing field. Because when it comes to God, you're Christians. You put that separation with yourself. You treat people differently. You don't take your places in the relationships. But let's level this playing field in the eyes of God and understand equality in the eyes of God. This is the heart of God. This is God's design. Harmony amongst humanity. Guys have different circumstances. Some are less fortunate than others. Some are the slaves, some are the masters. And God expects both parties to act like Christians. Amen? Paul finally addresses the slave owners. It was possible that culture affected them in this way too, right? If Roman slave masters ruled with an iron fist and were harsh, it was possible that Christian slave owners were accustomed to do the same thing. God has no respect for persons and is not impressed by titles. He expects his ambassadors to represent his kingdom accurately. The slave masters have a responsibility. Why is that slave master differently? Man, can you just imagine a reversal of this? What about the slaves who don't believe? And all of a sudden, they're getting treated in love, by, with love from a slave master? Why? Because they're believers in God, and they've received the presence of God in their life, and they're changing? What a beautiful opportunity for the people, your subordinates, to see it and be affected positively by it. Amen? A Christian slave owner is still a Christian. A Christian is countercultural. We're not supposed to be influenced by the culture around us. We're supposed to be influenced by the kingdom of God. That's what our influence is. We're susceptible to be under the culture's influence, but then when we read our Bibles and we read where we are in Ephesians now, it helps us in our walk in harmony. It changes us. You come to a Bible study today, and, and you may have been a person who was affected by the culture. And you may leave here today changed more, another walk further in your walk with God because of what? Because you helped understand the opportunity that you have to live an abundant life in spite of life circumstances. The opportunity that you have to glorify God in the small things because we don't really pay attention to the small things all the time. It's a great Bible study. It's not just like, hey, let's talk about the slave section of Ephesians today. It's like, what, what can we pull out of this? There's so much that could change our lives that we can pull out of this. Amen? Paul challenges the natural order of authority and respect and instills the biblical attitudes that Christ taught and modeled himself. Paul's not just this man who's just like, you know what? I'm just a man and I'm going to create this new testament and all these laws and all these regulations that teach people how to act and because Paul's a tyrant or controlling or something like that. No, he's divinely inspired. And, and, and what, is, what makes this accurate? How can we look at this and say, you know what? Paul is right. He's just a man. But how do we know that he's divinely inspired by God and this comes from God? Why? Because it, is, it, it goes hand in hand with what Christ taught and what Christ modeled himself. What did Christ do? He washed the disciples' feet. He was a servant. He said, the first shall be last. Jesus came to bring the kingdom. And Jesus showed us kingdom principles that completely were opposite our worldview. And that's what the kingdom is. And we see what Paul's saying, and it's likewise. He's like, this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what a person in the kingdom of God does. It goes hand in hand with what Jesus taught. 
Jesus taught the Beatitudes, right? And let's end with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Countercultural. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, Christ came and taught something, but he didn't just teach it, he modeled it for us. And we're to be imitators of Christ. What is the role of the church? To be imitators of Christ. What is the role of the church? To be thoughtful about the small things. To still glorify God. To be kingdom-minded despite life circumstances. A slave in a Roman Empire? Couldn't get worried. I don't think anyone's had a life as bad as that. We all have our trials and tribulations, but that's bad. That's harsh. They were fed to lions. That's bad. And here he's telling them, despite your life circumstances, be a Christian. Be a Christian. Heart of God. You'll win favor. Your rewards are in heaven. But do it because you love me. The role of the church. Amen? Let's stand and let's pray. Praise God. Anyone have a prayer request? Pastor Nancy? Amen. Okay. Dawn? Okay. Uh, Lisa? Oh, amen. Amen. Ah, uh, Jeannie? Mm-hmm. Of course, we'll pray. But we're also proud of him. That's, that's awesome. You did a good job there, Jeannie. Good job. Yes. It is me. Okay. Okay. Mitch. Uh, and that last part? To Connecticut. Okay. All right. Lots of uh, praying for healing. And uh, God can do anything. God is a healer. God is a protector. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up our friends and our family, Lord God. Lord, we're believers, Lord, and we can come together in faith and we can say, God, be glorified in healing, Lord God. Heal these um, ailments, Lord God, and be glorified, Lord Jesus. Let people see your glory. Let them see that it's you, Lord God. Let them receive miraculous healing, Lord God, because you have authority over all things. And Lord, right now we pray healing over all of these circumstances, over all of these people, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that it leads them closer and closer to you, Lord God, and that you will be glorified in this world, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for divine healing, Lord God. Lord, we pray for Daniel, we pray for Mitchell and his friends, for for traveling mercies, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you keep them safe in the tra- traveling, Lord God. But, Lord, I pray, Lord, for, for Daniel, Lord God, I pray for your, your voice in his heart, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that he's uh, confronted by uh, the culture, Lord God, by, by freedom, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you will hold on to him and keep him safe, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father God, that your 
convictions will be so heavy upon him, Lord God, that he will not be able to make uh, bad um, decisions, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father God, for this church, Lord. I thank you for them, Lord God. I pray that you will, um, Lord, I pray for Brandon, Lord God, who's in, uh, in Spain right now, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for getting him there safely, Lord. And we pray the same for him also, Lord God. Protect him. Be with him, Lord God. Uh, walk with him. Speak to him, Lord Jesus. And God, I pray, Lord, that you can help uh, Eddie and Lisa stay together right now as uh, they, they're worried and missing him, Lord Jesus. Father God, I pray for the church, Lord. I pray that you bless this church. I thank you, Father God, for the, uh, Lord, your spirit that's here. Uh, Lord, for your, the word that you give here, Lord Jesus. Uh, for the faithfulness of the saints that are here, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you just continually bless this church. And, and Lord, let it be a light to the lost. And I pray, Lord God, that you will draw the lost, Lord, to this, this place of safety and this place of your presence, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, the, the tithes. Father God, I pray that you bless the tithes, the offerings. I pray that you use them for your kingdom, Lord God, and that you bless your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Give and be.